went from, we left on, say, January 67. Picked up the scientist again at Andrews outside of Washington, D.C. <coughs> Go off to Alameda, the Hoboken of San Francisco. And from there we went to Mexico City, I believe, yes. Mexico City. And we've been there before. I survived without Montezuma's revenge this time. On our takeoff to Guayaquil, Ecuador, the coastal city in Ecuador, was on in the evening from Mexico City. I think as I tell you about this before, it was very warm and humid worry. Took off at seventy five hundred feet altitude there. We normally fly at eight thousand feet. So we we're only five hundred feet below our normal cruising altitude. So takeoff was kind of touchy with that full load of fuel we had on. We ran out to the end of the runway, it seemed, and the pilot lifted up the landing gear, and that, that defined taking off. The gear was up, so I guess we're airborne. And uh, we proceeded down along the Mexican coast, South American coast to Ecuador. A hot, steamy, smelly town again. And we stayed three days there. There was nothing to note there, other than we were being in one of their parks, and there was a sign on the tree, no PC deplantis. I guess it means don't pee in the plants, which I apparently was a big problem down there. But the Ecuadorian natives there, the uh, the indigenous population, which is the majority of the people, the women wore those fedora hats, like you see the Inca women wearing in National Geographic, or the round brim, round crown man's hat, basically. Well, that was the common hat wear, all, that was everywhere, in the hot, steamy weather. The exciting part was the flight from Guayaquil south along the South American coast. And we had a, we we're headed for Rio, which was on the way, east coast of uh, South America and Brazil. So to get from the Pacific to the Atlantic, basically, across South Central South America, which meant you had to get over the Andes. And to get over the Andes, that means we had to be at at least 24,000 feet to clear the peaks. And to ask our old airplane to get that high was quite, a, quite an accomplishment. It took us one hour to get from 8,000 to 24,000 feet. All four engines roaring up top RPM. The exhaust ports were glowing red in the dark. It was a beautifully clear night. I can remember passing over the peaks of the Andes, the snow-capped Andes. And this was summer. I don't know. Was, yeah, it was summer down there. Yeah. But these beautiful moonlit, starlit night at 23, 24,000 feet crossing the Andes Mountains was quite spectacular. And that was about the time that uh, that uh, airplane crashed in the Andes and the uh, some some South American soccer team was stranded for quite a long period of time and they wound up having periods of cannibalism, I think. But anyway, that was certainly on my mind as we crossed over the top top of the Andes. And basically just kinda took a deep breath and coasted into Rio, which was down at sea level again. I, I really can't distinguish the different trips in Rio. I'd have to look at my slides to see the different things I did. But again, we stayed out on the beach, on the Copacabana Beach. And uh, I was always looking from, for the girl from Ipanema. That was in Rio. The restaurants there were, uh, the big thing was steak, uh, Argentine steak. It was a bit the big 
main meal on most of the restaurants. Argentina is a huge beef producer. And quite a, quite a not necessarily a delicacy, but it just is a common restaurant meal. The, uh, the, the amount of poor people, now Rio was a phenomenally wealthy resort town, but you'd walk out your, your hotel room and you're swamped with street urchins. These like young boys, seven, eight years old, with shoe shine kits. Look at that, and they'd be hands in your pockets. And they, what they did to get you that, get a shoe shine, was they dab shoe paste on your shoe, say, oh, look, Mr. Uh, in, in their Portuguese, you need a shoe shine. So you're stuck there with that. Whether you had a shiny shoe or not, you got a big gap of shoe paste on your shoe. So you have a shoe shine. I can't think of anything else I did there of note. I think the last time I told you that I did go to the top of that uh, mountain that has the Statue of Christ on it, took the, uh, the Incline Railroad at the top. But I, again, I didn't go out to Sugarloaf Mountain because it just looked too tricky getting on a, a Brazilian cable car going across that bay. I figured that was something I'd rather postpone. And from Rio, we flew to Cape Town, and that's either my second or third trip to Cape Town, and they're all quite indistinguishable in my mind. I think I already talked about seeing the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans, where they meet off Cape, Cape of Hope Girl. From our Cape Town, we flew to Mauritius, I believe, and I've already been there. Well, the, the, the thing I remember about Mauritius was the contrast between the two locales. Well, I stayed in the two different times I was there. One time I was on the uh, the windward side. It, it is one of those typical mountainous tropical islands where on the, and the wind blows mostly one way constantly all year long. And on the Uphill, when the wind blows up the mountainside, you get a lot of condensation and rain, and then a kind of a rainforest environment. And then on the other side, the leeward side, you have the, the water, water is all uh, wrung out you know, because of all the rain happened on the other side. And they also have this phenomenon called uh, downslope warming, where they, when the air goes down the side of the mountain, it tends to get warmer. I won't go into the physics of that. Well, I can't, by the way. So anyway, the water, the air gets hotter and drier on the uh, leeward side. So the uh, one side of that island is a rainforest, and the other side is a semi-desert. I do have some photographs of the, the dry side. Uh, the Philippines, or not the Philippines, the Hawaiian Islands, very similar. We have a rainforest environment where most of all the, the tourist business happens. And then on the dry side is where the Navy, uh, the Navy base is. Navy Air Base, uh, it's called Barbara's Point. I think Pearl Harbor is over there think, somewhere. Also kind of dry, whereas the main touristy part of the, of the Big Island in Hawaii is lush and kind of rainforest area, but I'm getting off the topic. We left Mauritius for uh, Singapore, was Singapore was our destination? Oh, no, our destination was oh, Singapore. Singapore. But halfway through, across the South Indian Ocean, our way to Singapore, wait, the winds were not favorable. You know, we don't get a very good weather briefing on a place like that, because there aren't a lot of reporting stations on the South Indian Ocean let you know what the weather's going to be like. So sort of take off assuming the worst, but yet the worst sometimes happens. And we got low on fuel. And we looked around for a place to land. And if you look off the southeast tip of India, 
several hundred miles towards uh, Indonesia, there's a speck, Cocos Islands, owned by Australia. And it's just a dot. So we flew in there, and I uh, figured we must be the first time our crew has ever been to this place. And our crew has been all over the place. So we went into the flight operations office after we got refueled to uh, file our flight plan for our flight on to Singapore. We had a, one of our squadron patches that we were going to give them to hang on the wall. And by God, there was, a, there was already one there. So our, our squadron, our group had been there before. Not the date wasn't there, but sometime in the past. That crazy squadron had been there. We gassed up after a couple hours and started our adventure on Singapore. Now Singapore I've been to before. They had told probably all my tales combined in Singapore. And as I say, it was another one of those hot, smelly cities. And from Singapore we went on to where? Guam. Oh well, went to Guam, of all places which is to the east of the Philippines, probably halfway to Hawaii. Maybe not quite halfway. And we went into Guam and one of our crew members was from Guam. And uh, his whole family, of course, was expecting him. They threw a big party for us on the beach, under a palm tree, at that time, we just drove down that two-lane road until we came to a spot to say, this looks good. And this was like a picture card, postcard setting of a, a tropical island with palm trees, sandy beach, and nobody else around. So we, all that family, must have been 30, 40 people, got out, dug a pit and put a pig on the spit. And we had a roast pig, roast chickens, a real honest to God luau on this beautiful spot of beach on a beautiful island with nobody else around. It's be, since then it's become quite a, a tourist place, especially for uh, Japanese. So I bet you can't find that empty spot of beach on that island anywhere. We took a, a friend of mine and I got a motor, rid of the motorcycle when we toured around the perimeter of the island and came across the uh, a monument to Magellan who had landed there on his famous trip, whatever he did that. But it was overgrown with weeds and nothing special about this place where it was. We kind of hacked our way in and found this kind of large tombstone thing that, that was commemorating Magellan's stop there in some early 1600s, I guess, after Columbus, of course. And then we left uh, Guam to uh, Kwachin, I believe. Yokota. Oh, okay, we went to, uh, straight to Japan this time. Yokota, the Navy, U.S. Naval base outside of Tokyo. I think I, I took the bullet train when I was there one time. And as advertised, it's incredibly fast and incredibly crowded. Just like being on the New York subways, traveling over 100 miles an hour, but not underground, above ground. I can't, can't remember anything other than, oh, the, like I took also the city bus around. Not the city bus, but whatever buses they have out there. Well, I guess it was a city bus. Well, I noted that none of the houses in Japan, the private homes, seemed to have any gardens. They were all just like right up to the sidewalk. They're not the house, and as far as I could see, no backyard, just another house. So there are houses side by side by side, with no separation of note, and all like one or two story houses. Right up to the sidewalk, and a very narrow sidewalk in very narrow streets. 
that we all made of wood, all very tidy, but so crowded. I can imagine the firebomb attacks in World War II against Tokyo, how they just spread so fast, all this wood construction so close together. That's been incredible. Where did they have the wood from? Yeah, where did we go? Oh, the wood Wait. was, huh? the wood was, it got that from Japan. Japan does have forests up in the north. They're pretty well wiped out by now, but they import all their natural resources are important in, in Japan. Fuel, oil, steel. They're a huge manufacturing facility, but they have very little of any natural resources other than fish. American beef is important there. So from Tokyo, Wake. to Wake Island. Wake is, again, one of those nowhere islands in the middle of the Central Pacific. I think that was about my birthday. If I recall, I celebrated my birthday February 15th on Wake Island. Absolutely nothing there. There's no town. Just a military base on the Sandy Atoll. It had a, a crescent-shaped island with this lagoon in the center. Just about big enough to hold the airstrip. And that was all. Goonie birds all over the place. They're like albatross and like albatross. Big, big sea-going, gull-type birds. And where did we go from week? Yeah. Wait back to Hawaii for the zillion of time. Hawaii to where? Oh, how many people do you know fly from Honolulu to Acapulco, Mexico? One resort, tropical type to another. Probably nobody. I don't think there's any scheduled airline will do that. Fly you from Hawaii to Acapulco, Mexico. So, you know, especially in 1967, whatever it was. So I thought that was a unique thing to do. It's a long flight. How long was it? 16 hours. 16 hours. Pretty much average for us, I think. Yeah. I think we stayed in a kosher hotel, the Fasada de Sol. In Acapulco, I did go to see the famous cliff divers, but it, it wasn't like just going out and see people dive off cliffs. The only views you can get were from private property that were owned by uh, nightclubs, or day clubs, nightclubs. And you had to sit down and order a drink in order to watch these guys dive off the, uh, the cliffs. And it was just as advertised. There was a very high cliff, so these guys jumping off and doing headers right into the water. I guess they don't live very long beyond 40, the early 40s, because their brain kind of gets stirred in a bush after hitting the water so many times that's a high velocity. Hmm. So that was one of my larger disappointments in life, seeing these Cliff divers, which you had to see from a nightclub. During the day. But well, you could see them during the night, it was a big deal. During the day, they were open, but you had to, again, you had to pay to, uh, to buy a drink or something. Mm. And they also had the, uh, those parachute rides from uh, speedboats, where you'd take off for the shore and then drag you back and forth from the beach. You see that? It's quite popular now in beach resorts. You saw that in Nice. In uh, Nice. Oh, what I remember seeing in Nice was not parachutes with bare breasts. You saw the same thing. Quality diminished as you get further out from the central. I don't think the quality diminished at all in Nice when I was there. Yeah. Anyway, where did I go from Acapulco? Oh, back up to Alameda, Alameda which is, the, I get a suburb of. Uh, San Francisco across the uh, San Francisco Bay, really so, uh, just outside of Oakland. So we could take a ferry boat just across. I got a 15 minute ferry ride to downtown San Francisco Financial District. It was, as I say, it was a Hoboken of uh, San Francisco. And uh, from 
Mary went back to uh, Andrews to leave the scientists off. And, Corpus Christi. Oh, Corpus Christi. We did not go back directly. We thought it was Corpus Christi, Texas. I don't know why, and I can't remember a thing about it. I'd been there before for a period of four months in 1964, where I went to uh, advance navigation school. That's kind of a nowhere spot For some reason on the southeast coast of Texas. They have you going on a flight on the 26th. That's Corpus Christi to Corpus Christi, 7.3 Yeah, we hours. did. We did several of those. We just fly out and back, filling in some of the tracks of the world that we have to, probably over the Gulf of Mexico, and then from there we went back out to. Uh, to Andrews Air Force yes. Base at Washington. It says here you went directly to PAX. Oh. Well, the scientists must have driven home. It's only about a half hour, no, not a half hour, an hour drive back up to Andrews. Now, tell me a question. What, where did the scientists normally work? They worked in Washington, D.C. The scientists we took around were out of the Naval, I think it was called the Hydrographic Office. Now it's NOAA, N-O, a National Oceanographic and Aeronautical Subgroup. But they were stationed in Washington, D.C. And that's why we picked them up at Andrews Air Force Base, usually. I never, I guess I was up there. The very first uh, month I was in the, that squadron, they sent us to a uh, orientation school for uh, that they held once a year or so for our crew, to, the new guys up there, both the sailors and the officers. And they talked all about their mission they did, and both Project Magnet and the, uh, the uh, water temperature group that I occasionally flew on. We did water temperature uh, analysis of the Gulf Stream off the coast of uh, central the U.S.